Good morning, Bill. Enjoy this weather. And sailors and the ducks, enjoy this weather. <laughs> and Maria Lawrence and Maria, good morning to you. Good morning. I do not enjoy this weather. So, well, you know, there's always tomorrow. There is. You remember last year at this time, we had pretty much no snow for the winter. We did not get the March and April rain. And we got into the middle of the summer. You're right. And we had some serious water issues here in the eastern panhandle. So we're making up for it these three days. (laughs) We're not going to be below the the water table line this year. I can promise you that. It helps, but not like snow does. Because it's a slower Yeah, you accumulate most of the snow into the water table. Less so with rain. Yeah, too much runoff. But it does help. 839, our guest in this segment is one of three Democrats in the primary for U.S. Senate, the seat currently held by Joe Manchin, Glenn Elliott, the uh, uh, mayoral candidate of Wheeling. Good morning, Glenn. How are you? I'm doing just fine, Rob. Thanks for uh, having me on. You, you had hoped to be in studio today, but the travel <laughs> plans have been altered. Uh, yes, I really feel bad about that, but uh, we, well, as you know, you guys are getting some of the rain there, too. Uh, we had some uh, threats of severe weather uh, headed in our way yesterday. Fortunately, those threats seem to have passed us by, but the water, I mean, uh, the river levels here are, are rapidly approaching flood stage, and uh, we're projecting a crest here about 41 feet in Wheeling, which will put half of our Wheeling Island underwater. So um, it's not great news here, but at least we didn't get any of the uh, severe weather that we saw down south in Charleston and Huntington, uh, some of the um, uh, straight force winds. Uh, we did not see, uh, see that, fortunately. I saw some of the video from, there was a uh... A, a time lapse of speeding up of the weather shot of that storm coming through, and that was frightening. When you uh, saw it, certainly was. We had one of those. I think they're called derechos uh, in Wheeling two years ago. Yeah. Uh, ripped through the town and just knocked over eighty-year-old oaks like they were matchsticks. Um, so you hate to see anything like that. We're lucky no one got hurt then, and um, you know, we, we just live in a time where weather is increasingly more volatile. Uh, more volatile, and it you know it's. Um, incumbent upon us to make sure we have the infrastructure ready and the resources to keep uh, get people help but uh you hate to see what you see what you saw yesterday in charleston um i just hate to see it um because uh, that was us here two years ago in, in wheeling and that's kind of the new norm i wanted to ask you a question this isn't u.s senate related but it is wheeling related and mm-hmm. that happened over the last couple of months where the super six was uh the bid was moved to charleston and out of wheeling for the first time since what 1990 uh, five? It's what? been about 30 years, yeah. You know, we're a little sore about that one still, Rob. But, uh, you know, we did steal a couple tournaments from Charleston, uh, the MEC men's and women's basketball tournament. We were able to uh, uh, bring that up here. So I guess, uh, you know, Mary, uh, Mary Goodwin got her revenge. Um, I, uh, you know, I knew the Super 6 was kind of looking at moving a while ago. Uh, Charleston put, to get, uh, put together a pretty good package. We hate to see it go. Um, I'm going to have to give Mary Goodwin some extra grief. She's from Wheeling. I don't know if you know that. but. Uh, no. Um, it did go back down there. Uh, we'll do what we can at some point down the road to get it back. But, uh, uh, you know, that's the game. Um, you know, things like that get competitive. And, uh, you, you know, you can't win them all. Well, I tell you, I, I, I went to uh, – I haven't been to one in a while, but I went to four or five of those, and you folks just did such a marvelous job in wheeling of all aspects of that. So salute to you folks with a job well done. The contracts for how long, Glenn? I'm not uh, – I want to say five years, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but I, but uh, to Rob's point, I know that uh, high school football is almost a uh, – it's embedded in our culture up here in the High Valley. So, um, you know, growing up here, high school football was almost like a religion. And, uh, you know, a lot of people really do look forward to those games, and we are sorry to see them go. But, uh, you know, hopefully down the road another mayor will be able to get them back up here. Let's talk about your bid for the U.S. Senate. And uh, if you maybe – some members of our audience haven't heard from you before or on the program. I know you've been on a couple of times. Go ahead and tell everybody your uh, resume and, and why this uh, seat and why this time. Uh, sure. Um, well, look, um, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the obvious question I get a lot, which is uh, you're running as a Democrat in West Virginia in 2024. Are you crazy? Um, and to that, I'd say absolutely not. Uh, um, you know, I have experience uh, going on eight years as mayor of the city of Wheeling. I um, also have experience five years working for Senator Byrd uh, when he, he was still in office back in the 1990s. Um, you know, I'm an attorney by trade, though I haven't practiced law in years. Um, but I really think I, um, I bring the right skill set to this position right now. 
I recognize the Democratic brand in the state is not what it used to be. Uh, some of that is self-inflicted, and some of that is just a fact that the other side is, is uh, frankly, much, much more effective at defining us than I think we've been at defining ourselves. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, I mean, I'll be running on a message of opportunity of what we can do in the state. I'm tired of us. I remember uh, eight years ago when the governor ran for, uh, for governor, uh, he had those signs up, are you tired of being last? Well, you know, I check the rankings regularly, and we're still pretty much last in, in most of the important metrics of health, of education, of life expectancy, of, um, uh, of obesity, of diabetes. Uh, well, we rank at or near the bottom in just about everything. So I do think uh, uh, there's an opportunity for a message of, you know, looking at things a little bit differently. And frankly, one issue that I think is going to catch a lot of Republicans off guard uh, this fall is the issue of women's reproductive freedom. Um, you know, I've been going around the state talking to crowds, you know, mostly Democrats because I am in a, in a primary, but uh, talking to people outside the party, party as well, independents and, um, and Republicans. And a lot of them, especially women, are not okay with uh, the fact that uh, our current governor and the last legislature uh, basically stripped those rights away from women that existed for almost 50 years. And it's something that I think is going to surprise a lot of folks. We've seen what happened in Ohio, in Kansas, and some other states when those issues were actually put on the ballot. It's not going to be on the ballot directly here, but I'll certainly do, uh, you know, use, uh, you know, if I am going into the fall here as the nominee, I'll use every opportunity I can to make sure that, uh, you know, that issue is front and center. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Glenn. Uh, there's a couple of uh, – uh, you have a couple of folks running against you in the primary, uh, Don Blankenship and uh, Zach Shrewsbury. Mm -hmm. Will there be an opportunity for a debate between the three of you? Uh, you know, I would absolutely welcome that opportunity. I don't know if any has been scheduled yet. If you all want to consider hosting <laughs> one, I, I, you know, I will – I mean, I've said before, I will debate anyone, anywhere, as many times as it, uh, it needs be. I do think I am the most qualified candidate running in the primary, uh, the only one who's held elective office. Um, and, you know, I would welcome that opportunity. But uh, uh, no one has requested one or uh, no one has offered one yet. Uh, but if there's an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to do so, I'll be there. We talked earlier about swimming upstream within a Republican uh, mm -hmm. state. Uh, you have a similar disadvantage with uh, Blankenship. Uh, even mm -hmm. though uh, his name is kind of a double-edged sword, he does have great name recognition. How do you counter that? Well, certainly, um, you know, not only great name recognition, but, but in the southern part of the state, he does remain pretty popular. Um, and his uh, last time I checked, his bank account's a little larger than mine as well. So, uh, you know, he has opportunities there. Um, you know, I've not heard much from the campaign. I haven't seen him. At it. You know, I've been going around the state talking to a lot of, of different Democrats across in, in – and all the counties, and no one has seen him yet. So I don't know what his strategy is, whether there's going to be a late ad, blitz, uh, ad blitz or not. Uh, but look, but he wasn't. I, those who know him, um, you know, I think I don't think he'd be embarrassed to, uh, to admit no that he's never been a Democrat until just now. So I don't think he really represents a lot of traditional Democratic values. I think, um, you know, I think there are a lot of Democrats out there who are frustrated with the way things are, but I don't think he's going to be the. Uh, the, uh, the pathway forward for them. I think it's incumbent on me, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, urge that we chart a new, a new course. Uh, you know, I'm very, very excited about the candidate we have running for a governor, Steve Williams. I think he is going to uh, surprise a lot of folks. He's clearly the most, uh, the most uh, qualified person of the uh, five seeking that p uh, position, and I think he will do uh, much better than uh, polls may currently suggest. So, you know, um, you know, I just got to. Uh, for me, the key is just getting my name recognition up there. I know uh, lots of part of the state, uh, they don't know me that well yet. Uh, you know, we are going to be doing some ads and stuff here going forward in the primary. But for me, you know, I feel like any time I get a chance to talk to voters, um, you know, I really feel like it's, it's a favorable outcome. It's just i got to get in front of as many people as I can. Maria. So, um, so yeah, Glenn, so tell us, obviously, in terms of a war chest and everything, you alluded to the fact that Mr. Blankenship probably has a little more um, resources in that, in that vein. So what's your strategy there? I mean, we know this is a really large state. Getting around can be um, difficult, especially in, in the midst of, you know, rain for the past several days so mm -hmm. um so how do you intend to as bill said counter that what's your strategy um uh, uh, where how how are you moving forward there it's certainly uh you know it's certainly something we've been thinking a lot about the most strategic uh, way to spend the funds that we have uh you know we'll be looking at you know um obviously radio buys we'll be looking at 
at signage where appropriate. I'll be looking at um, uh, you know mailers, uh, whatever ways we can do to get the message out. And I'm going to be, uh, you know, my travel schedule has been a little bit derailed this week while we're looking at flooding here in Wheeling. But about before that, I've been on the road pr- uh, pretty much six days a week, and that will resume here as soon as we get out of this flood situation. And uh, you know, I'm just going to do my best to get out there and. Um, you know, maybe, um, you know, we could get some folks to throw a debate. I think that would uh, be a great opportunity for, uh, you know, uh, for uh, voters to look at all three candidates. Um, if Mr. Blankenship even showed up, I don't know if he would or not, but, you know, I'd certainly welcome that opportunity as well. But it's going to be an all, all, an all of the above. I don't know if we'll ha- if our budget's going to permit, uh, you know, a lot of TV ads or anything going forward, but uh, we'll certainly be as strategic as we can, recognizing that we have limited resources. And via telephone, by the way, with Glenn Elliott, he is the mayor of Wheeling, a candidate for U.S. Senate. And uh, Bill, I want to ask Glenn a question here in regards to some policy. If you are elected as a senator, uh, let's talk about the southern border, because that certainly has become sure. a very big issue uh, in this country, especially in the Republican Party primaries. Is that a big issue for Democrats? I think it is. Uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of voters, and I think it is. But I think there's... It, 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 on this issue, it's important to look at the contrast between the parties here. Um, on the Republican side, you basically have um, uh, candidates up and down uh, for every office running in West Virginia who who basically take their marching orders from one person. Um, you know, um, you know. On the Demo- on the Democratic side, you have a lot of different viewpoints. Um, you know, I I personally think that the deal uh, that President Biden put forward and worked with uh, Senator Lankford and Senator Manchin and others to put together a couple months ago was, uh, for a Democrat, a pretty big concession. Uh, it had a lot of things that Republicans typically talk about, uh, you know, strengthening up borders, uh, the border, hi- uh, hiring more agents, speeding up the process for deciding on asylum and all that. That was in that bill. And, you know, everyone in our delegation who's a, Repub- a Republican would have supported that, uh, but for the fact that they were told uh, to walk away from it. And I think that's a big contrast in the parties here is we have uh, Republican candidates who are absolutely terrified of doing anything uh, to win the disapproval of the former president. Uh, like, that's not the case for me. I will stand up to President Biden if, uh, if I think he, he's wrong, and I will, su- I will support him if I think he's uh, right. Uh, in this case, it's fair to criticize the way the border was handled for probably the first couple years of his administration. But he did make a significant concession and angered a lot of Democrats in agreeing to a deal that the Republicans walked away from. That, Quite frankly, they did so. It's one of the most cynical things I've seen in modern politics. Uh, it, it had 95 percent of what they would want on any given day, and they walked away from it. I um, mean, you know, I'll be reminding voters of that, that they had a chance to get the deal that um, – I would have solved a lot of these problems, but they wanted the issue more than they wanted the solution. And that, uh, to me, is really beyond the pale. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Glenn, earlier you mentioned abortion, which is yep. a tricky issue in, in, under any circumstances, but I think even more so now, and I believe it will be a campaign issue, and you alluded that you would make it a campaign issue. Uh, you're in a very conservative state, which mm-hmm. I think there's a, probably a uh, uh, they're against abortion in total. Uh, some pockets be in favor, but a lot of them be against. Uh, you, we also had a, a constitutional amendment that was defeated uh, back, I think, around 2015, 2016. That was before the Roe versus Wade. Uh, how, do, how do you plan to play the abortion issue? Uh, uh, Bill, that's a great question. And, you know, I would say uh, we do live in a conservative state. I do think a lot of folks, you know, are, are personally uncomfortable with the idea of abortion for themselves or for their families. Uh, but the, uh, what's changed is is the uh, right of other women uh, to make that choice for themselves. Uh, you know, the Dobbs decision really changes the entire dynamic now. Uh, this is, uh, uh, to me, if I'm the Republican Party, I'm I'm kind of feeling like the dog that caught the car. This was always a rallying cry, this issue, uh, for years, but now we have it. I've talked to multiple women around the state who are, um, you know, who describe situations they've had. For example, um, uh, you have a miscarriage, and there's a, 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 the doctor wants to do a DNC procedure afterwards, um, which, is, which is technically similar to an abortion, uh, uh, but not that... It's a different thing. It's after a miscarriage has already occurred, and there's no heartbeat in the child, for example. Uh, that, uh, that now... Uh, probably cannot happen until the woman's uh, health is actually in danger. Like, like that's the world we live in now uh, where the government, like the party of limited government is now basically uh, 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 putting itself in the doctor's office uh, uh, for conversations that really shouldn't exist between the woman, her family, and her doctor. That's where we are right now. And you talk to women about this, and like I said, like they may – 
uh, they themselves may not think that an abortion is something they would ever want to do uh, for moral reasons, uh, but the fact that it's like that right has been taken away from all their fellow women across the state now is something that's just not sitting well with a lot of them. I'm talking not just about Dem- uh, Democrats here. I'm talking about folks up and down uh, uh, sort of every income spectrum. Uh, you know, everybody knows someone who's had an unwanted pregnancy or, or a complicated pregnancy, and now we've basically injected the law um, you know, into that conversation in a way that it hadn't been before. So I think it, I, quite frankly, it's, um, you know, the issue now is going to put Republicans on the, def- uh, 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 on, the, on the defense a lot more than they have been, and I don't know that they're prepared for it. Um, you know, they talk about pro-life. It sounds great. Who's not pro-life? Uh, but the reality is for a lot of women, they're putting women in situations that are anything but family-friendly and anything but pro-life. They are, um, you know, uh, uh, potentially putting some woman at risk and forcing women to leave the state for basic reproductive care that, you know, they had two years ago. So, you know, I'm happy to talk about this issue until I'm blue in the face. I recognize that for some uh, it may be a non-starter, but I think, I think this is a majority winning position in the state right now. And if I was a Republican candidate, I'd be worried about it. The DNC issue is an intriguing one that you bring up, Glenn, because my wife had to get a DNC. I think uh, the first pregnancy mm-hmm. went 11 weeks. There was a miscarriage. She needed to get a DNC. And... I'm seeing in some states, I think Texas, but I'm not 100% certain, but I just recall watching this on a uh, news program a couple months back Mm. that uh, women in these situations couldn't get the DNC in their state because of the laws Mm -hmm. and had to go to another state. Now, when these laws were passed in West Virginia or tightened, I interviewed delegates and asked and senators and asked about this, and they said this would not be something that would be affected by that. However... The insurance companies of these doctors and the attorneys for these doctors are advising them don't do anything that can be misinterpreted or is even closely aligned with abortion because you don't want to go to jail over this. And so they're just not doing the procedure and saying, sorry, I can't help you. That's a dangerous situation. It is absolutely, and uh, my wife had a miscarriage a couple a couple years ago before we had our son, and, and and you know, miscarriage in itself is such an emotionally and physically traumatic experience to go through, and now you add the fact of of you know a doctor not being able to do what's best for you, uh, but being worried about being sued or thrown in jail. It is just, it's it I guess it's a step towards uh, making women second class citizens. And look, um, um, you know, I, I I understand deeply in my heart how some people are are always going to be vehemently against the idea of abortion and that it's I think it's ending a life uh, but you know I really think we have to trust women to make the best decisions for themselves and their families and you know uh, like there's this notion of women just like gleefully rushing to get abortions and, like just to spite people or something which doesn't happen at all like these are deeply personal decisions I mean I don't know any, any woman who, uh, who who would gleefully get an abortion and um, you know do so uh, for any reason other than it's just uh, she's not in a situation uh, you know where ha- uh, where having a child is either good for her health or her situation. I uh, you know to me it's 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 just a basic freedom that you know existed for 50 years and the Roe v. Wade framework to me was a pretty good balance. Um, you know, it separated the uh, uh, pregnancies into three trimesters, um, you know, basically gave uh, uh, women unfettered rights for the first trimester, uh, allowed states to have some restrictions in the second, and then pretty much, uh, you know, only permitted abortions in extreme circumstances for the third. I think that was a pretty good balance, and I think it was, uh, you know, took into the interest uh, both the life of the mother and the well-being of the mother and the, and the life and well-being of the unborn child. So to me, you know, if elected to the Senate, I would support legislation to codify Roe v. Wade. I think it was a mistake in the first place that Congress never made that the law. Uh, they let the Supreme Court do it. And I think as a result, uh, anytime the Supreme Court makes major social change like that, it's always going to, um, you know, it's going to feel sort of anti-democratic. And I think it would be much better if this is something that, you know, Congress could, uh, could do in its own right. Uh, you know, I would certainly support that as a senator. Glenn, you you obviously not afraid to uh, to address hot button issues. Oh, you not at me- all. You mentioned the <laughs> border. You mentioned abortion. Are there other issues that are kind of known at our basic uh, societal structure that you that you'll raise in your campaign? Well, you know, uh, look, um, um, you know, like these aren't hot button issues, but uh, you know, 
in the last couple of years of uh, President Trump's administration, he submitted budgets that called for pretty drastic cuts to Social Security and Medicare and other entitlements. Um, you know, we need to be a very, like, very, a very, very clear here that this election, a lot of things are on the ballot. And, you know, I understand that Social Security and Medicare, you know, uh, on their current tra- uh, trajectory, uh, you know, do run into some issues. Uh, but we need to look at ways to make sure we sure up the financing for that. Um, you know, we can't just talk about these I mean, if we've made promises to our seniors, uh, the, um, you know, Social Security and Medicare are probably two of the most successful programs in the like, history of this nation that, that have granted, you know, entire generations of, of seniors a dignified retirement. I um, mean, you know, we need to make sure that these are priorities. And, um, you know, if you look at the – if you listen or, or read between the lines of, you know, the last budget submitted by President Trump and what a lot of folks have been saying – you know, in the Republican caucus, while I say they want to pr- protect these issues, uh, their math doesn't really add up. If they want to do, uh, they always want to talk about big tax cuts, particularly tax cuts that favor the wealthy. Uh, but the math's not going to add up. You know, we have to get the balance under uh, the budget under balance at some point. It hasn't been balanced since I think 1999. Uh, but but I don't want to do that on the backs of seniors, and I think that is going to be one of the um, you know. The most critical differences between the Democrats and Republicans going into these fall elections is, you know, their math is not going to work. Um, they can't do what they want to do without at some point cutting these programs that benefit seniors. So, you know, I'm happy to talk about that, you know, every day of the week as well through the camp- uh, for the rest of the campaign season. Maria. So um, some would argue, Glenn, that this is kind of a leap for you to go from the mayor of Wheeling <laughs> to the United States Senate. Sure. Um, sometimes there are other steps in between, like the West Virginia House of Delegates, Senate, sure. what have you. Um, was this just the right time for you? Um, is that what prompted you to do this? Or, um, yeah, tell, tell me about that. Yeah, well, for me, honestly, the... Um you know, I had planned to take a step away from politics. I have a two-year-old son. I'm term limited out as mayor in Wheeling. My term ends in a couple months. And that was the plan. And then when Senator Manchin decided not to seek a re-election, I really um, I started giving it some thoughts. Some people reached out to me, encouraged me to, uh, to consider that seat. Uh, the Senate, to me, is a very special institution. It's, it's considered the world's greatest deliberative body. I don't know if it really reaches that here lately, but, you know, I saw it in the 90s when it still was. Of that institution of a lot of, of you know, a, a vigorous debate. Uh, to me, the Senate has been one of the bedrock pieces of our republic since its founding. And for me, it's just a special one. I recognize some may see it as a leap, but being mayor of Wheeling is a no small task here either. Uh, our city is big enough to have a lot of big issues, but it's small enough to where everywhere I go, people, uh, people come up to me and talk to me and, and challenge me and say, you know, what about this? What about that? So, you know, I've, I've served in the front lines here. I have experience in, in the Senate. Um, you know, I've been pretty familiar with a lot of these federal issues over the last um, uh, 35 years I've been an adult or so. So, you know, I'm ready for this job. Uh, I mean, I think I'm as qualified as anybody running right now for it. And, you know, I think if people get a chance to hear me, uh, that'll be very, uh, very, very clear to them. Glenn, thanks so much for your time this morning. We greatly appreciate it. It's been my absolute pleasure, guys. I'm sorry I couldn't be, I'll be there in person. Maybe next time. Next time, sir. Glenn Elliott, Mayor of Wheeling and a candidate for U.S. Senate on the Democratic side. He is one of three running for that seat in the primary coming up May 14th with early voting beginning May 1.